Welcome to ONS Energy Talks. My name is Ingvil Mellon and I'm the program director of ONS. Today we will talk about the oil market, but we'll also talk about the main players and how we expect them to act and try to look through a geopolitical lens. I'm very thrilled that we have with us one of our favorite oil energy analysts. She is the co-founder and the director of research and chief oil analyst of Energy Aspects. She's the member of ONS International Advisory Board and her Twitter description says she's a full-time oil analyst and a part-time kickboxer. Amrita, is very, we are very, very glad that you have joined us today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm sure that you've, I mean, you know that there's a lot of companies and the nations that are bleeding outside due to the low oil price. Uh, and, but you live off uncertainty and volatility in the markets. So how, how are you these days in trying to, to figure all of this out? Yeah, you, if you thought quarantine would be a quiet time, it's been the opposite. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, this is the time when mo everybody, anybody who's touching oil, whether it be financial or physical at a refinery or as at a producer, everybody needs analysis because, you know, it's so uncertain. We don't even know how much demand is falling by in April, uh, let alone for the rest of the year, what the recovery is going to be. And then, of course, the supply uh, side response from Saudi Arabia, the other key players that you mentioned earlier as well. It is going to reshape our industry for years to come. So, you know, we've never been busier. Uh, and yes, working from home has its own challenges with the big team, uh, keeping them motivated. But at least, you know, if, if everybody's busy, it, it does help because I think the worst thing is just, you know, just being at home and uh, getting bored. So in, in some ways, there's, there's a silver lining in all of this. Uh, we, of course, we've seen a supply shock, but also we've seen a big demand shock to it. But let's start with the supply shock and try to get into the to the brains of of the the main players. Uh, uh, I go a bit back. A couple of weeks ago, Saudi Arabia and Russia and OPEC uh, kind of their cooperation stranded. Uh, what did happen, and why did they why did they end up in a market share war? You know, this is it's it's an interesting question because I was in Vienna myself and. Uh, going into the meeting, all my meetings with the ministers there were very clear. They absolutely wanted a cut. And, you know, initially it was 600,000, then it became 1.2, then it was 1.5. Of course, in hindsight, those numbers make, would have made no difference whatsoever, uh, given that we are talking about 20, 30 million barrels per day of demand drop this uh, month. But, of course, nobody knew that at that time. Um, but what was interesting is that we were probably the only ones who really started to get this hint from Thursday onwards because of our meetings there. Saudi Arabia and GCC countries, but particularly Saudi Arabia, was very clear on one thing. And to be fair to them, this has always been their view. They were not going to cut production if Russia didn't contribute. And the interesting thing in the Russia angle is that, you know, Russia was told by Saudi Arabia in December of last year, the, the previous meeting, that would be their last cut. Uh, from there onwards, they would be allowed to raise production and they agreed to that because it was the Saudi Aramco IPO. So again, there were political considerations. But Saudi Arabia said, look, yes, that's true. And we all expected uh, production to have to rise in the second half of the year. But this virus, and remember, this is like uh, the, the conversation started in February. Um, the virus had just started and it was very much a China event. And they were like, look, the virus is a big deal. Demand is falling, so we need to cut production. And Russia's point was, we don't know how big the virus is. Russia actually really believed the virus wouldn't be that big a deal, which was clearly wrong. Uh, and that's why they didn't want to preempt any cuts. They're saying, oh, we cut and it will be over tightening the market. So their view was, let's push this back to June, which is when they're going to meet anyways. And Saudi Arabia was like, no, we are not going to carry this. It's either a deal to cut production or there's no deal. And Russia just didn't believe in cutting into a falling market. They're like, look, we don't know what demand's going to fall, fall by. We're going to uh, collapse in price anyways, or at least come off in price. So what's the point? We can't really save uh, the price level by doing anything. Hmm. And that was the crux of the argument. Of course, Russia has always been um, very keen to drive out U.S. shale. Uh, there's also sanctions on Nord Stream 2, and I think that's very important for European gas markets. For Russia, gas matters a lot more politically than oil. And sanctions on Nord Stream 2 has been viewed by Putin and Russia as a direct attack on Russian gas. 
and its availability in Europe because essentially US is trying to make space for its LNG uh, in the long term in, in Europe. So there was a lot of animosity and, and a lot of people were saying, and you know, our view is also the same, that Shell was anyway coming off, private equity money had gone away. This was the time. If, if there was the perfect time to push Shell over the edge, this was the time. And, and Russia really believed that. Underlying all of this, however, we understand politically there was also a, a demand, which is get sanctions lifted. And we weren't quite sure exactly what sanctions they were. I think over the course of the last two days, it's become very clear what those sanctions were. US has sanctioned Rosneft trading because of its activities in Venezuela. And what has happened over the course of the last few days, Rosneft has moved all of that over to a Russian government entity. And of course, the US has said, if we have no proof that Rosneft trading is involved in Venezuela, we will lift those sanctions. So there were lots of layers, but ultimately it boiled down to Russia saying, we are not going to cut. And Saudi Arabia said, if you don't cut, we're not going to cut. And therefore, they chose to massively increase production. Now, that I do think that was Saudi Arabia's move. Russia didn't really say that oh, we were going to increase production that much. But for the Saudis, it's all in or nothing, effectively. And Saudis were saying, if you don't agree to this, we're going to flood the market. And therefore, they pushed production to 12 or supplies to the market to 12.3 million barrels per day. So you're saying that Russia, they underestimated the corona effect. Uh, and they kind of said that this, I think actually they used the word, this is a drop in the ocean when it comes to production cups, the one discussion in, in March. And they wanted to wait until June. What can we expect uh, when you come to June? If kind of, will they do something else which is not the drop in the ocean? Look, I think uh, over the last uh, few days, uh, there's already been consultation started uh, between, uh, yes, I mean, this is where it all gets very weird, between the US, which has got thousands and thousands of producers but they are under so much pressure, you know, irrespective of the price of Brent or WTI, physical crude prices. So for instance, in, in Norway, uh, Ecofisk prices are actually trading in single digit uh, because effectively the differential to Brent is so wide. And the same in the US. So US producers are actually coming to Trump and saying, we need a production cut. We will all contribute. So the US has reached out to Saudi Arabia and Russia. They've lifted sanctions on Russia, uh, or, or at least Rosneft trading to, for, for their activities in Venezuela, or they're talking about it. So Russia said, fine, we are willing to cut. And if Russia is willing to cut, Saudi Arabia is willing to cut. So on 6th of April, uh, there is the OPEC Plus meeting, um, which is effectively talking about cuts of 10 million barrels per day. Now, we still think this is highly, um, kind of dubious in, in terms of the numbers. To get to 10 million barrels per day, OPEC would have to take the lion's share of that cut. But Saudi Arabia has said, and Russia has said, we're not going to be the only ones cutting. Every producer has to join, uh, be it the US, and that's their main focus, but Canada, Brazil, Norway. Um, I don't think you can get such diplomacy done in such a short period of time. Yes, maybe down the line, you do put together a really big cut, but that's not going to happen overnight. But yes, to your question, it's going to happen before June. Uh, clearly, the heads of states are talking. And remember, for Trump, it's an election year. He's always wanted low oil prices, but suddenly he's woken up and realized, I'm going to lose tens of millions of jobs in Texas if I don't save the oil industry there. And that's why there's a lot of activity going on right now about trying to put together like a 10, even 15 million barrels per day cut. So we'll come back to, to, to the US and Trump in a minute, but just, and uh, we were trying to get into the heads. So could you help us to get into the heads of, of how the Saudis are, are thinking? And it's important to understand their incentives, their time horizons, the tra strategy. Uh, elaborate a little bit on, on how they are thinking uh, regarding the, the oil market and the long-term economic development. So I would say there are two things to um, kind of consider when it comes to Saudi and really even Russia. Economics is one and politics is the other. Purely from an economic point of view, their strategy, which was to flood the market and uh, at a time when demand is weak, right, makes a lot of sense economically because that would drive out low cost producers. And our conversations really, sorry, that would drive out high cost producers. And our conversations did really say that. They were saying to us, look, why should we be the ones always cutting? and shale and Canada and everybody else who's high cost that keeps raising production. And if you fast forward two years, 
there is a big possibility that sanctions on Iran is lifted or even sanctions on Venezuela are lifted. They will have to make space for these countries to come back. So therefore, that strategy very much was being driven by Aramco saying, look, we're going to produce maximum. I don't believe they could produce 12 million barrels per day sustainably, but yeah, they could produce 11, 11 and a half sustainably. That would drive high cost producers out of business, especially when demand has collapsed. And then in two years time, and you know, really on our numbers in 2021, you create such a supply shortage that it is really OPEC and the low cost producers that are out there standing and supplying the world. That was that is their economic objective. Having said that, they also don't want hundred dollar oil. They want high prices for sure, but they they absolutely want to weed out high cost producers. Politically, though, it is a different ball game because this is where Trump comes in, and clearly, economics was the strategy driving them. But over the last few days, politics has taken over, and you're effectively seeing Trump. Uh, putting pressure on Saudi, and we know that Kushner is very close to MBS, and I don't think they can just ignore the pressure the U.S. is putting on them effectively. So you, you're saying that this situation is moving from economics and oil to, to politics. Um, uh, very interesting. And I just want to elaborate a little bit about kind of how Saudis are thinking around their, uh, their kind of, the ones they are cooperating with and the ones they have more rival, uh, ri rivalry around. So they have a long and turbulent relationship to Iran. Where do you see Iran in the current, uh, this situation? And I mean, they're very hit, hard hit by the corona, as we've seen. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on, on, on Iran and where they are at the moment? I think Iran, honestly, had it not been for the coronavirus, would have probably been liking the situation because clearly these prices are hurting Saudi Arabia a lot more than Iran, simply because Iran's exports are already like barely at two to 300,000 barrels per day. They were hardly getting any money for it anyways. Most of this is just barter for goods. But what has really hurt uh, Iran, as you said, is the virus. And you know they, they have been one of the worst affected countries. So all their focus right now is on that domestic uh, coronavirus issue. And I think that's why you have seen them being quite quiet. They have, they've asked IMF for funding. This is the first time in decades that they've done so. Um, they are going to be under a lot of pressure. I mean, potentially even pressure on Khamenei and, and you know, the IRGC. But I think they've managed to just about scrape through this one. There's a lot of criticism internally, of course, on how they've handled it. But if, if the virus kind of levels off and they can come out of it, I think Iran will come out of this stronger. But I think the impact on the economy is going to be devastating from the virus, pretty much the same as everybody else's. Uh, one other country I will mention in this, since you kind of brought up uh, Saudi Arabia and its rivals, I think this isn't just about high cost producers in non-OPEC. Countries like Iraq, countries like Nigeria, where they need $50 plus for their budgets, they will get absolutely decimated uh, given the current price environment. So there will be, I mean, the, some of the poor countries will get poorer after this virus and then kind of, that's that's for sure. Um, kind of going from one problem to another one. Uh, uh, you you know, the Russia and Saudi Arabia have some some uh, relationships when in the Syria, Syria crisis. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on, on their thinking there? And I know that the, the oil market is, is, is a big part of it. Absolutely. I think for Putin, the reason for being in OPEC plus has actually always been linked to Syria. It's given him the upper hand in the region. Uh, he's always wanted a, 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 an, up, like an involvement in the region. But in some ways, Syria has taken a little bit of a backseat recently just because of the developments there. I think Turkey has become more involved there. Mm -hmm. And I think the Turkey-Russia uh, tete -a tete which you're seeing in Syria, but also now in Libya, I think that's become a bigger headache for Russia. But having said that, um, I think from the from the Saudi point of view, at least, I think Syria is there. And of course, there's a lot of funding that's still going in, but it is not as high up on the priority as it say used to be. For Russia, it still is. And I mean, until and unless there is a proper regime change or Assad really goes away, Russia's involvement will absolutely be there. And that's why they are still keen to cooperate with OPEC at at least a broader level. Hmm. Uh, that's uh, just dwelling a little bit on Russia then and kind of the geopolitical landscape. Uh, do you want to know any reflections on what Russia's next step will be? You mentioned the the the, the quarrel or the the reactions on the on the sanctions on, on the North, North Stream and uh, 
elaborate a little bit on Russia and, and where they are now. I think, look, Russia is clearly not in a comfortable position either. Their company break-evens are very low. They're like as low as Saudi Arabia, and the ruble has been coming off. So their company break-evens are like $2, right? They're fine. But their budget, again, like they do break-even at $42, and we are a lot lower than that. Of course, Saudi Arabia breaks even in the 70s, so that's very different. Um, but they have a buffer. They have a sovereign wealth fund. They will be drawing that down. But again, much like in most countries, now they're being hit by Corona. I mean, now they're pretty much put the country in lockdown. They're saying demand will be down 40%. So one of the things they're struggling with, just like everybody else is storage. Now they're going to be forced to cut back production anyways. If that's the case, then why not do a deal, quote unquote, a deal uh, to get production uh, down and prices up uh, politically. The big thing for them is sanctions. Uh, North Stream, there's been a little bit of a movement and they are kind of working around it via Ukraine. So that will get built. It will be slow, but it's going to get built. Therefore, their focus has been on Rosneft and uh, the sanctions around Venezuela. Uh, Russia is not going to leave Venezuela, but they definitely wanted sanctions off Rosneft because that's their trading arm and that's kind of where they need the most amount of flexibility. And I think because the US actually needs um, the the Russians and the Saudis to come together, you're actually likely to see a deal uh, and sanctions being lifted. And that's kind of where, what the Russians want. That's interesting uh, to, to hear your reflections on that. You mentioned also, uh, just know, uh, I'm jumping back and forth here, but move back to the US. Um, you mentioned that uh, Trump has kind of got, come into this uh, to this discussion, uh, doing his tweets and uh, wherever he can he contributes. Um, but, and you said that historically the US has never done kind of a coordinated production cut, but we have seen discussions now in uh, Tex Texas uh, that they, they are considering it or actually discussing it. Well, how, do you, how do you see the US uh, actions into this? Yes, I mean, can you imagine US becoming a part of a quote unquote cartel? <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the irony of all of this, because remember there was a time and we were talking then as well a few years ago when Trump was telling OPEC, how could you cut production? Prices are going up. And now he's begging them to raise production. Um, and you know, sorry, the other way around. How could you? Yeah, how could you raise production? And now they're asking them to cut production. So, yeah, it's, it's just been the, the U turn, the full 360 degree U turn has just been amazing. There is precedence for Texas cuts. It's happened once in the 1970s where they can prorate each producer to cut. The problem is the Texas Railroad Commission commissioner wants it. That's fine. A lot of commissioners are opposing this because this is Texas only. And you can argue Permian is the main growth center. So that's what matters. And Ingleford and Gulf of Mexico would probably come under this as well. But what about North Dakota? What about Oklahoma? They don't have these same rules. Ultimately, the reason it doesn't work in the US, just like it doesn't work in many other countries without national oil companies, there are thousands and thousands of producers. How are you going to enforce production cuts? This is why we think this whole talk of Trump and talking about 10, 15 million barrels per day cut, it's a window dressing. US production was falling even before the price crisis. Mm -hmm. Shale has peaked. We've been saying this for a few months now. The base declines are very high. The biggest changes capital has left. Private equity is not interested. And now with this price fall, with US prices say in the Permian, WTL, West Texas light prices were at $3 two days ago. There is no money to be made. Production is going to fall anyways. They are just going to disguise this as a production cut. That's my problem with this whole thing, that this isn't a real cut. And if Saudi Arabia or Russia are expecting Texas, even if it's not the, all of the US, to join this on a permanent basis, they're very, very mistaken, simply because there's no mechanism to actually control this. Thank you, then we can, we can take that out of the uh, equation. <laughs> um, we also need to, to go move to the, to the demand side of this. I mean, even if it's been a supply shock, I understand that the, the demand shock is kind of much more significant when it comes to, to volumes. And uh, the big question, the, the dollar, big dollar, I mean, a thousand dollar question is when will the demand get back? But as you started this discussion saying that your clients are kind of wondering how much the demand will fall. But uh, comment on, on the demand side and, and when will it get back and when, what, how, how do you see the, the, the predictions? You know, like you mentioned, the supply shock and a lot of our clients are also saying to us, oh, this is a supply shock. I actually think this is a demand shock much more than a supply shock. You know, the supply increases you're talking about is maybe 3 million barrels per day. 
from OPEC, non-OPEC, like US was already declining, we could have managed that. The demand shock, we have never, ever seen something like this. All our charts are quite literally off the charts, like the declines that you're seeing. Uh, 20, 30 million barrels per day of decline. Uh, there are some estimates which say that three quarters of the world today is in lockdown. And I think the issue is, like we, our assumption is, the peak of the shutdowns are April. It's still there in May, but it gets incrementally better. Uh, and by end of June, you start to get things to normalize. It doesn't mean people will start flying immediately or everything will come back, but at least the worst of the social distancing is behind us and you start to gradually recover. It's going to take all of this year into next year. And I think next year, then all the stimulus will matter. The real challenging question for governments right now is, yes, we are all trying to, or they are all trying to keep the pressure on healthcare systems low. But what about the long-term pressures from quarantining people? The mass unemployment that governments are going to create, I mean, if you look at the US claims, even in Europe, the claims that are going up every week, the long-term impact on, impacts on poverty, on uh, people's health, mental and physical, we can't quantify that. And I think the real worry we have is that the impact on the economy, in some ways the cure is worse than the disease, is going to be far greater and far longer because of these quarantining measures. Really, the only solution is testing, and nobody in the world is really ready for that, right? So effectively, the demand loss, it's not going to be 20 million barrels per day, of course, but even in the second half, we are probably not going to be higher year on year because of the jobless situation that we have, the weak economy, government spending is going to be required, I think you really start to see, and by the way, there's talks of a second wave of virus and assuming the governments are better prepared and there's maybe a vaccine or testing mm -hmm. kit, the second wave shouldn't be as bad. But still, I really don't see how demand properly recovers well into next year. Second half of next year, I think things will be back to normal, but first half is still a bit iffy. Um, one thing I will say, a lot of people are asking us long-term demand questions about, oh, does this uh, make home working more of a thing that's bearish for demand? At least from my team, everybody's dying to get back to work. <laughs> so I'm not so sure that this is a long-term change. If anything, people, and a lot of operational people have said to me, they realize how unproductive it is at work. I think for our jobs, it's easier. But if you're at a refinery, you can't really control stuff from home. Um, so yeah, I think I think there are a lot of changes that are going to be taking place, uh, but they are definitely expecting not much of a recovery, at least before year end this year. So I'm I'm glad that you're saying that the demand will pick up again. Uh, that's your expectations, but still you're concerned about the kind of the economic collapse and and how this will leave people. Uh, we see unemployment uh, all around us and, and uh, kind of we are even in the Western world and we can just imagine how this will play out in, in, in the poorest the parts of the world. Um, and building on that, if you look to kind of do the Asian markets in China and in, in India, which I know you know very well, um, do you have any comments on what we're seeing there and uh, kind of on the energy side or actually more broader on, on the society side? I think the main thing has, on China has been they are really pushing for a recovery. And they're saying, look, yes, we really were hit in February uh, and some parts of March, but now this is full throttle. And China can do that. It's a centralized economy. They, you know, they can they can force people in, in many different ways, which Western worlds and democracies can't. Um, but I do think Chinese demand is recovering well. You're seeing that in the numbers. We track a lot of um, real-time data, power consumption, traffic. And yeah, things are pretty much normal, 80%, 90% normal. But the issue, of course, is the rest of the world is now going into a recession and China is very dependent on export. So there will be a hit. India is different in the sense that they, they are now in lockdown for three weeks. And the real criticism has been, again, what I mentioned earlier, people are going to die of poverty and hunger before they die of this virus. I can't see how these measures stay in place for much more than this month, uh, just given the backlash that you've seen. Of course, from the energy side, both gas and oil refiners and LNG importers are declaring force majeure. China did that earlier. Now India is doing that. And that's why it's coming back to bar, uh, suppliers, right? Like uh, essentially uh, for a producing country like Norway, it ha it's obviously extremely bad news for, for anybody that's moving these barrels is very bad news because the biggest demand center, China, went through it. At least now it's coming back. 
But now India is going through that rough phase itself. Again, this doesn't mean long-term demand disruption. And one other thing is that pollution has really come down in both countries tremendously. Maybe that does give them a little bit of a breathing room uh, to be able to ramp up activity without you know, having the same kind of pollution effects. So they can catch up, uh, but it's not going to be in the near term. Hmm. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of take you back to pre-corona, uh, because in the oil market, in, in China spe specifically, uh, we were talking about the US becoming uh, the net exporter of energy. Uh, China's had a, had a, a positive growth rate. Uh, there were kind of energy security issue where they would want their energy to come from, uh, given the kind of the bit turbulent uh, relationship to the U.S. and and kind of how would you comment on U.S., China, Middle East uh, before and what will happen going forward? I think look before it was all about the China-U.S. trade war, right? We haven't heard that in a long time, um, but. I mean, the whole point was China was trying to diversify. They were trying to import more from the U.S. Then the trade war kicked in. Tariffs were slapped and they said, fine, we're not going to import anything from the U.S. And they were obviously swinging back more towards North Sea. They were buying more Norwegian crude, for instance, and gas as well uh, from other parts like from Africa. Um, similarly, they were buying more from the Middle East. Going forward, I'm not so sure that's going to change very much because uh, Trump has, of course, been calling this the Chinese virus and the Wuhan virus that hasn't gone down very well in China. Now, of course, he's backtracked. But again, these things, China does remember these things. Um, down the line, I think one of the things to bear in mind is pharmaceutical. China is doing everything they can to build hospitals, ventilators, medicines, because they've said in our conversations with the government authorities there as well, they've said one thing. Look, the virus is probably going to come back. But we cannot afford to do um, this to the economy again, what we've done. So we are going to be prepared. But they also control a lot of the supply chain. And I think that's where the Western world is very worried. If China stops sending some of these to the West, what happens? And I think the US, especially with Trump's relationship there, needs to be worried about that. Uh, because again, China does hold a lot of cards. Thank you, Amita. I think one of the takeaways of, 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 out of this conversation is that the uh, this the oil and uh, we are moving from oil and economy into to politics now. And you've seen that their their leaders of the different uh, majors have kind of started to get involved in the, the processes. Uh, kind of the Corona situation will force uh, production cut, cut in a medium in the medium term. Um, and you say that. The, the cure is worse than actually the disease. And I think that's an important takeaway for, for where we're going forward and uh, making sure we don't end up on a human catastrophe and an economic collapse. Um, and with those uh, kind of very optimistic words, <laughs> uh, I would like to say thank you, Amrita. Do you have any last comments to us? No, thank you. I hope everybody's safe. And, you know, I really do believe um, as an industry, uh, we will come out of this and, and we'll come out of this stronger, but it is going to be very challenging in the next few months as we navigate through these like, unprecedented times. But I think 2021, 22, uh, we'll see a very, very strong energy market. Thank you very much, Amrita. We look forward to seeing you at ONS and thank you all to uh, the, our listeners uh, for, for joining us this uh, this morning.